Good morning, everyone. Presenting Annie Machon, she has been working for the MI5 and one day blew the whistle. I'm very excited about her talk, What Can We Do to Counter the Spies? Please give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much for that, and it's uh, wonderful to see so many people here at this time of the morning. I mean, even I was tempted to stay in bed, it's a bit too early for me, so thank you for coming along. Um, this morning I want to take a bit of time to talk you through what it's like to be recruited and work for the dark forces, for the spies, but also to describe what happened um, when I decided to leave with my ex-partner, David Shaler, and blow the whistle on them. We've already had one talk, very moving talk, about what it's like to live with the state surveying you constantly. And um, it moved me particularly because we did go through very similar experiences. It's also, I want to go through some of the other things we need to think about, because I think today we're in very dangerous times. We are sliding rapidly towards totalitarian states, and we really do need to sharpen up and think about what we can do to counter this. Otherwise, we will be the generation that gives away our form of democracy. So I'll probably be talking for about 45 minutes, and um, then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. as has been stated, I worked for MI5, which in the UK is the Domestic Security Service. Um, in the UK, there are three different services. There's MI6, which is the sort of James Bond wing of the intelligence world, or they like to think it is anyway. Um, and then, of course, MI5, and then we have our listening post, which is GCHQ, um, Government uh, Communications Headquarters, and that's the biggest agency. That works very, very closely with the NSA in the US. Now, MI5, for 80 years, it was founded in 1909, for 80 years, worked unofficially in the shadows. It didn't exist. I mean, even MPs in our House of Parliament were not allowed to question what it got up to. If they asked a question, they were just told, no comment, national security issue. But things changed in 1989 after a series of whistleblowers and also a series of scandals. Um, For example, in the mid-1980s, some of you may remember a whistleblower called Peter Wright, who wrote a book about his time in MI5, where he said that they were running around London bugging and burgling. I always have to be careful how I say that. Burgling their way around London. Um, And they were out of control. So in 1989, MI5 came out of the shadows and was put on legal statutes, whereby they had, for the first time in their existence, to obey the laws of the land. And this came into force with the Security Service Act. Now, that meant if they wanted to do things which, if any of us did, would be called illegal, they could still do them, but they had to do it with the permission of their political masters. And in this case, that was the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister. MI6 and GCHQ were not put on a legal footing for another five years, but finally in 1994 they were too, uh, with something called the Intelligence Services Act. And I just raise this because during my recruitment to the service, I was told again and again that they now had to obey the law, they had to um, respect human rights and civil liberties in the UK, and also that their work, the focus of their work, was shifting from the bad old days of counter-espionage, Cold War, uh, political subversion, to look primarily at things like terrorist targets. So when I was being recruited in 1990, It all sounded pretty good, you know, this is something that could really make a difference and help to protect my country. Um, I didn't actually mean to become a spy. In fact, they very rarely recruit people who do have a fixation with James Bond. I had no interest in the subject. In fact, I wanted to be a diplomat, um, and I sat the foreign office exams. I quite fancied the whole idea of swanning around in foreign embassies drinking champagne. But uh, I wanted to be a diplomat, I sat the foreign office exams, and then a month later, I got a letter on Ministry of Defence headed notepaper. And this said, there may be other jobs you would find more interesting. Now, I don't know why, but my gut instinct was, oh, fuck, it's MI5. I was really frightened. And I wasn't going to respond to that letter. But unfortunately, I'd opened that letter in the same room as my father. And he was a spy addict. He loved all those books, things like John le Carre and James Bond and Len Dayton. So he said, go on, just do it, just ring them up and see what happens. Well, (laughs) the rest is history. Within a month, I found myself in an unmarked office block in the centre of London, being grilled about my life from the age of 12. The initial interview went on for about three hours, and they wanted to know my political views, my religious views, ethical views, everything. 
And um, of course, when you're being recruited by MI5, you think they know everything about you. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> so you're probably more honest than you would be in a normal job interview. No little sort of holes in your CV being gently glossed over. You just chuck everything at them. So I was constantly surprised that I kept getting through each stage. And um, it's a very long and convoluted process. It takes about 10 months because you have to go through a two-day exercise as well, where you have to do lots of analyzing, reading, writing tests, role plays. Uh, you get analyzed by psychiatrists and senior intelligence officers, the whole thing. In fact, the recruitment process is a lot more difficult than actually the job is when you get there. And of course, you have to be vetted. And in that case, for MI5 and MI6, it's pretty intensive, as I suppose you'd expect. They ask you to nominate four friends, and they go and talk to them. And then they ask those four friends to nominate another four friends. And so it goes out like a ripple effect. But you can still be quite clever. You know, so long as you know who's being approached, you can make sure you get your story straight, and you can slip through somehow. Anyway, after 10 months, and um, a great deal of open and honest talking with them, they still said they wanted me. So I walked into the training center and went through my first two weeks induction. Now, you might think that would be the sexy stuff. That's when the sexy stuff starts, where you're trailing people around the center of London or listening to telephone intercepts or something. But MI5's focus was paper-based. This is 1991. And um, the first two weeks training was just literally how to write a note for file or a briefing. I mean, that was it. It was pretty dull, a bit of a shock. Anyway, um, after that, I was sent to my first posting. When you're an intelligence officer for the um, agencies, you tend to move around every two years. So you're a specialist for two years in one area, then you go and investigate another. And my first posting was to a section called F2, which was the department that investigated political subversion. Now, all the way through my recruitment, they'd been telling me they no longer did all that stuff. You know, the bad old days of investigating reds under the bed and left-wing activists was long gone. And I thought I was going to be a counter-terrorism officer. So it was a bit of a shock to be sent to that section. I found out subsequently they tended to send the mavericks there because they saw it as a politically sensitive section. But um, it was weird because we're talking 1991 now, two years after the Berlin Wall had come down. So any idea of you know, domestic subversion being influenced by the Soviet Union was long gone. But MI5 didn't seem to have picked up on this yet. So I spent two years there investigating a bewildering array of minute left-wing groups. Um, things like a Trotskyist group like the Socialist Workers' Party, which had about a thousand members. And in fact, was not subversive per se, because they believed that there should be a democratic uprising. They engaged in the democratic process. Even so, I was astonished to see the scale of the investigation into this microgroup, because when I took over the desk, there were still about 25 to 30 agents planted all over the country investigating the local branches of the SWP. It was crazy. I spent two years shutting down the study of that group and also terminating the agents. Now, when I say that, it's not quite as lethal as it may sound. <laughs> shutting down their activity. I then moved on to a section called T Branch, which was the hot section at that time. That was looking at the IRA and other Irish terrorist groups. And I thought this is you know, much more what I should be doing, what I was interested in doing. And it was also a newish area of work for MI5, because in 1992, they'd finally wrested control for the investigation into those groups in the UK, away from the Metropolitan Police Special Branch. And this, of course, a huge stink. I mean, all the different competing secret agencies loathe each other anyway. But for one agency to grab the work of another caused real bad feeling. And it was here that I started to see things going pretty badly wrong. We're talking about um, tens, if not hundreds, of illegal phone taps. And we're talking about attacks that could and should have been prevented. Attacks, big, large bombs on the UK mainland, planted by the IRA, that should have been stopped, but actually were detonated and killed people. I just want very briefly to mention um, a couple of them. The first one was a bombing attack in 1993 up in the no northeast of the country. And in this case, uh, one of the IRA activists, a man called Sean McNulty, who was subsequently caught and subsequently convicted and subsequently released under the peace agreement in Northern Ireland after serving about four years. Um, in this case, he planted two bombs in a gas terminal. And he had a choice of seven pipes to choose from, which ones to plant those bombs on. 
and the two bombs he placed on the only two empty pipes. It was just a pure fluke that he hadn't placed them on the pipes full of gas. If he had, the explosion would have been massive, and it would have taken out a row of terraced houses near the gas terminal. Now, the reason I mention this is because there was very good intelligence before the attack went ahead to show that he was at the heart of the mainland IRA campaign. What had happened was there was a safe house where the coordinator of the campaign, a man called Hugh Jack, um, lived up in central Scotland, a very remote little place. And of course, MI5 were aware of this, and they were watching the house, and they had a very sensitive technique, something which, in my book, I was told to take out by the authorities, because nobody's ever heard of it, to monitor people. There was a, a camera placed outside this guy's house, CCTV. Nobody's ever heard of that, have they? Anyway, MI5 thinks this is highly secret and highly sensitive information that nobody's allowed to know about. Anyway, Sean McNulty had actually gone up to meet Hugh Jack to be tasked about what to do, and he'd been captured on film. Now, this was in 1993. And bear in mind, you know, in those days, newspapers were routinely sending photographs down the wires. I mean, that was perfectly standard technology. But MI5 hadn't quite got to grips with this. What happened is they had a little van that used to drive all the way up from London, go all the way around all the different police forces <coughs> in Scotland to pick up all their sensitive material and drive all the way back down again to London. The whole process took two weeks every time. So, McNulty is photographed going into this IRA safe house. The photos don't reach the desk of the investigating officer, who happened to be my ex, David Shaler, for 10 days, during which time the attacks had gone off. There was another um, problem with this investigation as well, in that they did arrest him, they did question him, and they found um, trousers that he'd been photographed wearing on the day of the attack with Semtex traces on. So this is pretty hardcore evidence for a trial. And yet somehow those trousers went missing. So you have the Northeast Police Force saying, no, it wasn't us, it was the Met, and the Met saying, no, it was the Northeast Police Force. Despite that, he was still convicted, but it was a 10-2. Um, divide on the jury, by no means unanimous. The other attack that went wrong was a big car bomb, lorry bomb, that went off in Bishopsgate in the city of London in 1993. Now, in this case, the person who planted that bomb had been under surveillance for months, and in fact, could and should have been arrested six months prior to Bishopsgate when he went to check another lorry bomb, which he'd sequestered away in a car park in London. He actually, MI5 had it under surveillance. They drilled a little hole into the lorry and could see the fact that it was full of homemade explosive. And then this guy, Cyril Jimmy McGuinness, rocks up um, to check his lorry bomb's still there. And he's just walking away. The moment to arrest him had come, but nobody was there to give the executive order. <laughs> it's just crazy. The guy in charge of the operation was AWOL. Um, rumor had it, went round the service, that in fact he was with his mistress that night, so he turned off all his bleepers and his mobile phones. Who knows? Anyway, um, McGuinness was allowed to go free, and six months later he bombed the city of London. Now, this one bombing caused £350 million worth of damage. That was a huge insurance payout, which was actually double all the insurance payouts which had gone before in, the, in Northern Ireland for the whole previous civil war there. It also resulted in the death of a press photographer as well. Anyway, you see these things going wrong. This was two years in T-Branch. And you see these things going wrong. You see the mistakes being made. You raise them with your bosses. You keep saying, look, OK, a mistake's been made, but let's learn from this. Let's change our routine. Let's do something different. Let's sharpen up. And they just kept telling us all just to keep quiet. Don't rock the boat. And they just don't want to learn. But the really bad stuff came in um, David Shaler's and my last postings, and that was in a place called G Branch, which was international terrorism. Now, David at that time was head of the Libyan section, and he saw a number of things going wrong, which became increasingly serious. And this is why we decided to leave the service and why we decided to blow the whistle. Um, to start with, there was a very expensive, illegal phone tapping operation against a noted, very famous left-wing journalist in the UK called Victoria Britton. She was the deputy foreign editor of a national newspaper called The Guardian. And um, they investigated her, even though, even though, in the public domain, there was clear evidence she was not doing anything wrong. But the senior management in G Branch got terribly excited by this case, 
you know, it's good old-fashioned subversion. It's a left-wing activist. Let's go and get her. And this is crazy. In fact, there was one moment when、um, David was arguing with his、uh, big boss, saying, "Look, there is no justification to look at this woman." And the guy turned around and just said, "Well, you know, this is the biggest case we've ever had on the Libyan desk." David turned around and said, "Well,、um, hang on. What about Lockerbie? <laughs> Slightly bigger thing." But that illegal phone tap operation went on for about a year and cost the state three quarters of a million pounds just in terms of getting the bug in place and processing the、um, information that came out of it. But there were two cases that were much more serious.、Um, both cases of what has now become known as false flag terrorism, which is where、uh, terrorist atrocity takes place, is blamed on one group. But is actually, of course, carried out by another for their political advantage, their political gain. Now, the first one resulted in the imprisonment of two innocent Palestinians. This came about when the Israeli embassy in London was bombed in July 1994. Now, in this case, a car bomb had been driven up and placed just outside the embassy and had exploded. Very sophisticated device, very high-grade explosive. In fact, it was so high-grade that the bomb consumed itself. There were no forensic traces left. Now, even the IRA couldn't do that. So, very, very good technical skills behind the construction of that bomb. The police didn't really have a clue about where to start, but they did a sort of big sweep and picked up known Palestinian dissidents in the UK, and two people ended up being convicted of the attack: a young woman, well, she was then called Sama Alami, and a young man called Jawed Botme. They were both Palestinians studying engineering in the UK, and they were convicted not of causing the attack because they had cast iron alibis that day, but of conspiracy to cause that attack. And they were both sentenced to 20 years each, just for that. And they've always proclaimed their innocence, and they proclaim their innocence to this day, and they are still rotting in prison to this day. So we're talking 13 years on. So even when they've done their sentences as well, because they're not UK citizens, they will immediately be deported back to Palestine. Now, the reason this caused us massive concern was that there was information within MI5 which pointed the finger at Mossad, which is the Israeli intelligence agency, and they really are the, the scary ones. Even MI6 and CIA are frightened of Mossad. And、um, this information was an assessment written by a senior manager in MI5. Today I'll just call him G91. That was his James Bond number, but I know who he is. And he'd seen all the evidence and all the intelligence, which couldn't necessarily be put into a courtroom, around the case. And his assessment was that Mossad had carried out the attack themselves. Now, you know, you read this on the internet, you probably think it's a mad conspiracy theory. As I said, this was a senior manager's assessment, formal assessment of the case, and he assessed that they'd done it. One. To try and push for increased security around Jewish interest buildings in the UK, the Israelis were con constantly paranoid by、uh, the number of、uh, Arab dissidents who were given safe haven in London and felt perpetually under threat there.、Um, but MI5 never saw that there was any real reason to increase the threat level to the embassy and increase their protection.、Um, but also, the two Palestinians, Alami and Botme, were very politically active in London. And in fact, they'd been building up a support network for the Palestinians back home, you know, just raising money, raising awareness, big media campaign, in order to try and raise awareness amongst the general public of the plight of the、uh, people on the left bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, by framing these two, this shattered the whole support network. Everyone else involved just ran for the hills. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? So Mossad would have gained two clear advantages: massively increased protection, which is what they'd always wanted, and of course, getting rid of a very annoying and rapidly growing political network in London. Now, when Shayla blew the whistle on this, you would have thought there would have been an immediate retrial, at the very least. These two should have been released, had a retrial with the new evidence in front of the jury. But when their appeal came, and it did eventually come, the judges just ignored all. English case law and all European human rights law, and just threw it out. They would not listen to the evidence. So, as I said, those two are still rotting in prison to this day. In fact, there's quite a big、um, uh, campaign to try and help get them out early. So, if anyone's interested in getting involved, please do have a word with me afterwards. <clears throat> But the final case I want to talk about, and this really is the case that made us quit, was an illegal assassination plot. Against Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. 
Now, again, you think, you read this on the internet, it'd be the wilder fringes of conspiracy theory. But in this case, in 1995, there was a walk-in to the English embassy in Tunis, basically a volunteer, who just went up to the British embassy and said, can I speak to the local MI6 officer, please, as you do? In fact, I'm sure that's why MI6 officers always work under di diplomatic cover, because then everyone knows where to find them. Anyway, this chap was a senior Libyan military intelligence officer, and he was codenamed Tunworth. And he made contact with a man who has been named in public already, an MI6 officer called David Watson. David Watson became his handler. And Tunworth basically said they had a cunning plan. He had a ragtag group of Islamic extremist terrorists in Libya, and they were plotting to overthrow Gaddafi. And all they needed was some funding to try and promote that coup. The payoff, of course, would have been, you know, BP, British Petroleum, getting all its nice, fat, juicy oil contracts back once they seized power. And also, at that point, he promised to hand over the suspects for the Lockerbie bombing. <clears throat> this is one of the primary um, aims, one of the primary goals for MI6 at the time. So they leapt at this opportunity. Now, without very many checks about Tumworth or his background or his credibility, MI6 started throwing money at this group. And there appear to have been at least three payments of around $40,000 each time to this group. So we're talking about over $100,000. Tumworth went off, bought all his equipment. I mean, we're talking even jeeps, tents, that sort of thing, as well as the guns and explosives. And um, that was it. Nothing was heard for a few months. Now, as I said, David was the head of the Libyan section in MI5 at this time. So he was being briefed officially about this by his counterpart, David Watson. But he didn't really take it seriously. He you know, warned his bosses it might go ahead. But he just thought it was MI6 pretending to be James Bond again. I mean, they were always coming up with these crackpot schemes, and nothing really ever came of it. But this one did happen, because one morning, the report started to come across David's desk, which basically said there had been an attack against Gaddafi in a small town called Sirte in Libya. And a bomb or grenade, something had exploded underneath a car in uh, Gaddafi's cavalcade. Now, they got the wrong car. Gaddafi is manifestly still alive, and, of course, the new best friend of Western leaders. So, people in the car were killed. Uh, bystanders, innocent bystanders, who were just sort of, you know, cheering Gaddafi as he went by, were also killed in the ensuing security shootout. I think uh, the estimate was in total 11 people died that day. And, uh, you know, this is an illegal attack as well, because as I said before, MI6, under the 1994 Intelligence Services Act, now has to get the permission of its political masters to do things which would otherwise be deemed illegal. Now, in this case, they didn't bother to get that permission. So we're looking at an act which is not only unethical, highly reckless and a highly inflammatory part of the world, but also illegal under British law. So as I said, this was the case that made us quit, that made us decide to leave the service, and to go public about it. In, the, um, in the, the UK, there are no avenues for whistleblowers. There are no legal protections for intelligence whistleblowers. Nowhere you can go. If you want to make a complaint about crimes that you witness within the agencies, the only person you can legally go to is the head of that agency. So who, watch, who guards the guards, indeed? So the only option, really, is to go to the press. And you think with something of this magnitude, this heinous crime, that immediately the government would want to start an investigation, would want to have an inquiry into why the spies were running out of control. But it doesn't quite work like that in the UK. The government is really very frightened of the spy agencies. In fact, we have a problem because we have a Labour government, well, Labour, you know, supposedly socialists, they're more right-wing than Genghis Khan at the moment, but most of them in their fiery youth as student activists were involved in what used to be deemed to be politically subversive groups, as in the Socialist Workers' Party or Militant Tendency or the Communist Party. So pretty much every single Labour cabinet minister for the last decade has had an MI5 file. Now, they don't know what's on those files. It's probably very little. You know, it might just be a little bit of identifying information. But they've got all these guilty little secrets rattling around in their brains, and they think MI5 might know about them. So they are desperate to keep the spies sweet. And it's something to bear in mind. Every time you see yet more draconian powers and resources being thrown at the spy agencies, I think that's a very good reason why that's happening. Anyway, so Dave and I left MI5, and we went to the papers. And 
pretty much happened, what happened to us、uh, was very similar as to what happened to that poor woman whose husband has just been arrested for terrorism. In terms of the degree of surveillance, in terms of friends being turned and reporting on you, in terms of having to go through the whole prison rigmarole, trials, etc., etc. But of course, we knew what to expect to a certain extent. We were, after all, the gamekeepers turned poachers. And because we knew what to expect, we went on the run. When the story broke in July 1997, we decided, rather than just sitting around in our flat waiting for that knock on the door, the inevitable arrest, and up to two years on remand before any trial, we decided to flee to Europe. And、um, in fact, flew. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Now I don't know if there are many French people here, but thank you, France, because that's where we ended up, and、uh, we had a certain degree of protection there. <laughs> but it was slightly comical as well, because you talk to the newspapers, you build up trust with them. You know, the whole process goes on for months, and the stress ramps up and ramps up, and then suddenly they want to run with the story, and it, you have to do it now. You know, it just goes really quickly. So we had three days' notice after months of waiting about whether this story was going to go. And that was on the Tuesday. We went to a Sunday newspaper called the Mail on Sunday. That story broke five days afterwards, and we decided to flee out of the country. But it was a bank holiday weekend, so it was virtually impossible to try and get a flight out. I think I probably got the last two seats to get out of the UK.、Um, we hid originally in Holland,、um, holed up in a little hotel in Utrecht, and.、Um, Were joined there by the journalists after the story broke, and it was a huge, huge story. I mean, I cannot underestimate the repercussions at the time. And with the journalists, we moved from hotel to hotel, being driven around the flatlands of Holland. It was like it was like something out of a John le Carre novel at that point. And then, once we'd done a little bit more work with the journalists, and I'd given my side of the story as well, we fled as far as we could in, the, in one day. We went all the way down from the Hague to a tiny, a little、uh, city in the southwest of France called Bayonne. And that day, we thought this is all going quite well because the story had broken. We were in the news, so we had a certain degree of protection as whistleblowers. And the government did what it always does in a situation like that—a knee-jerk reaction. They took out an injunction. To gag the press, so they weren't allowed to report anything more we had to say. The press wasn't allowed to follow up anything that they may already have been told. And this is great in the UK because you know then you get the press jumping up and down in fury, saying, "What about press freedom? It's an assault on our、um, our, our freedoms and things. We need to stand up to the government pressure." That was great. We thought we're going to be protected now. We have the media behind us. Unfortunately, we went to bed after celebrating rather too well that night, and woke up to some slightly bad news. La princesse, la princesse Diana est morte aujourd'hui. Like, what can you do? <laughs> the biggest story of the century, pretty much,、um, just knocked us out of the media, and that was that. We were lost in Europe, with、uh, no prospect really of、um, protection from the media anymore. So we spent another month, really, literally, moving around from hotel to hotel, pretty much every night. Looking over our shoulders at all times, we knew that they would be after us. Using just cash, of course, never use cards because they can be traced. Never put a card in the wall. Certainly, never allowing anyone to know where we were or what telephone number we were on. Actually, this is a bit weird because we knew at that point. This is 1997. Bear in mind, but、um, MI5 could listen to your telephone calls, and they could trace、uh, where you were phoning from, but they couldn't trace incoming calls. It sounds crazy now, but they couldn't do it then. <laughs> so we could ring people, but they couldn't ring us. Anyway,、um, we had a whole month on the run. In, the, in that time, as I said, they'd taken out an injunction against us, but they'd also gone and raided our flat. It was our home from the previous four years, and they did a counterterrorism-style search, which basically means they went in using the、uh, hydraulic hammer and ripped the whole place apart. I don't know what they were expecting to find: secret documents stashed in the bath pipes or something, but. They literally ripped up the floorboards, smashed the furniture,、um, took our bed linen. Why? <laughs> I mean, the whole thing was just weird. They also had a great time going through、um, my underwear drawer, as I discovered when I went back to pack up the flat. Anyway, we holed up in a little French farmhouse after that,、um, 
kept a very, very low profile. We, didn't, we started working with a lawyer, a guy called John Wadham, who was head of the Human Rights Agency in the UK, an organisation called Liberty. He represented us. I went back to the UK after a month because I knew I did have to pack up the flat, sort out our affairs, and I knew I would be arrested. But at that point, I hadn't really said anything about intelligence, so I didn't think I'd be prosecuted if I had to take the risk. And um, it's a very, very difficult feeling to hand yourself voluntarily into custody. And I knew I was going to be arrested at the airport when I landed. I was being accompanied by my lawyer. And, of course, they started the usual spiel, you know, you're being arrested under the Official Secrets Act. And then they said, and we're arresting you under the Criminal Justice Act. I thought, oh my God, what else have I done? <laughs> Turned out that I was an international money launderer. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Nobody told me. Basically, what happened is um, David and I took some expenses from the newspaper to go on the run, and we had a joint bank account. So that made me an international money launderer. The proceeds of crime or whatever went into my account. Anyway, I got arrested, was taken to the terrorism suite in the police station at Charing Cross in London, and was grilled for that day. They'd gone through the flat, obviously. They'd found various love letters David and I had written. So had a great time reading that out to me, trying to break me. Um, then they did release me without charge, but kept me on police bail for six months. And then I had a week to pack up the flat, when I really realised the full magnitude of what they'd done to our home. David, in the meantime, had gone and holed up in a little French farmhouse in the centre of the country, very, very remote area called La Creuse. And I joined him there uh, about a week later, and it was primitive and remote. We had no car, because of course that would be so too easy to trace, uh, no television even, so we had to do a lot of talking, a lot of reading. Um, and it was freezing cold. We were there for 10 months while we tried to negotiate with the government. We tried to say to them, look, we've got all this other evidence of criminality on the part of the spies. Please take it from us. Let us come back to the country and give you this evidence to investigate. And they kept refusing. They kept refusing. So in desperation, um, this was in 1998, David decided to set up a website, uh, shayla.com. And he was going to publish carefully details of things like the Gaddafi plot to try and bounce an investigation. Um, he also decided to use, through the injunction, a route to disclose that information in the national press. So at the end of um, July 1998, we went up to Paris to meet the journalist to do the story. And this is when the spies got really frightened. They didn't want this information to come out. And this is when they arrested him and tried to extradite him from France. Now, fortunately, we were up in Paris, because if we'd been holed up in Creuz, I'd be absolutely stuck in the middle of nowhere. But we were there, and we sort of knew, you know you're being followed, you know something isn't quite right, your hackles are up. So one night when we met the journalists, we said, look, we've got to get out of this hotel, move to another one, let's just keep moving around, we don't want to be caught. Even so, I think they tracked us through his mobile phone, and um, David went out one day to watch, uh, I think it was a football match, on Sky TV in one of those English bars in Paris. And um, it was a pre-season friendly, and his team lost again, so he wasn't in the best of moods. And he was on his way back to the hotel, and rang me and said, I'll be there in 10 minutes, and we'll go out for some food. So I'm waiting in the hotel room, and there's a knock on the door, and I think, great, he's forgotten his key again. Uh, but it wasn't. I sort of opened the door. Three very scruffy counter-terrorism officers from the French DST, the equivalent of MI5, were standing there. And uh, they said, we have Monsieur Shaler. Um, we want his identifying papers, his passport. He didn't have it with him. What he'd done was he'd sent them up to get the passport, knowing it wasn't there, because that way at least I would know what had happened to him. If he hadn't done that, he would just have vanished off the streets. And in fact, I didn't see him again for another two months, because they put him under very stringent secrecy laws in the French prison, because the British government said he was some traitor selling secrets to an enemy power. No, he wasn't. He was a whistleblower trying to expose crime on the part of MI5 and MI6. Anyway, he was in prison for four months almost in total. And everyone, everyone thought he would be extradited. But the French, bless them, said what he had done by blowing the whistle was manifestly a political offence, and they did not extradite people for that sort of activity. It was quite a stressful day, shall we say. Um, there was a sort of choice going into the courtroom. Either he would be extradited, in which case he'd be sent straight back to the UK, held on remand in a high-security prison for two years, and then convicted, or he'd be released that evening. So, a bit of a stressful situation. 
As I said, thank you to the French, they released him, and we had one hell of a party. It was great. Anyway, um, just to fast forward a little bit, I'm conscious of the time moving on. Uh, we spent another two years living in Paris after that, um, continued to campaign around um, exposing the criminality of the spies. And in that time, we saw friends and family being arrested as well. The ripple spread out. We saw a student who'd come over to interview David for her student newspaper being arrested under the Treason Act in the UK, hauled out of her lecture theatre by special branch police officers. Uh, we saw journalists being convicted around David's case as well. So it was a big ripple effect. They were desperate to keep what he had secret. After two years of really pushing it as far as we could go, we decided to come back, go back to the UK voluntarily. And again, big media hoo-ha. But we thought, you know, the Human Rights Act had come in. There is a guarantee of freedom of expression now in the UK law. Well, ha, there is for most people perhaps, but not for intelligence officers or former intelligence officers. David expected to be put on trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act within six months. After all, the police had three years to do their investigation. What more did they need to do? But they insisted on hauling us through a whole series of pre-trial hearings designed to make sure that by the time he came to trial, he couldn't say anything in his own defense. In fact, it was pretty much a kangaroo court. The judge ordered the jury to convict him, which just breached all basic case law in the UK. Um, he wasn't allowed to freely question his accusers. Any cross-examination of MI5 officers who came to accuse him was vetted by the prosecution and by the judge and crossed out. So it was pretty much a kangaroo court, and inevitably he was found guilty. But um, the thing that concerned me in a way even more, I mean, you know, we'd done the prison experience before. You know, do it once, you can do it again. But um, the thing that concerned me more was the way the press was manipulated in all this. Because I was sitting in the courtroom when the judge gave his formal judgment. And he said, you know, he accepted that Mr. Shaler had done what he'd done in the public interest. There was no venal motivation. No lives were put at risk. So imagine my surprise when I looked at the papers the next day and all the headlines said, Shaler sells agent lives down the river for money. It's like, hang on, are they just crap at taking down shorthand or something? I just didn't know. I didn't get it. But looking at it now, I mean, having had a lot more experience of working with the media in the UK, the mainstream media is so under control, not just from the government spin doctors, but also from the spies themselves. There's even a section in MI6 which is called Information Operations, which is designed to manipulate the media. It can plant fake stories to create a trail in the media. It can spin stories. It can react to stories and say, no, 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 of course, that's all rubbish. Don't believe it. And um, we see this again and again. I mean, if we saw this in the run-up to the Iraq war in the UK, there were screaming headlines saying that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, primed to go off 45 minutes and kill UK people. So we had headlines saying, 45 minutes from doom, which came straight from MI6 and the government. Whereas, of course, that's all now been proven to be absolute rubbish. So I think this is a real problem as well in our democracies, because we are looking at a situation where we have the government, we have the spy agencies, and we have the fourth estate, the media, who are supposed to hold these people to account, but who are now part of that charmed circle. I can see very clearly how it's, how it's manipulated as well, because the, the journalists have to take the briefings, take the stories, in order to get the copy in the newspapers to keep their jobs. So this is where I think, you know, the internet can revolutionize how we approach these sort of issues. You know, we don't use the mainstream media anymore. Nobody trusts it. Everyone knows it's just the mouthpiece of the government, which, again, is another sign of a totalitarian state. Anyway, so that's a bit of our sort of story in terms of what we went through. But I think its continuing relevance um, now is what we're up against, because it's manifestly obvious that the spy agencies haven't reformed, haven't learnt from these lessons, and in fact um, are growing stronger and better resourced as the years go by because of this unending war on terror. And this is something that we do need to address because we have agencies that are operating outside any democratic control. There is no real accountability, certainly in the UK, over the spy agencies. There is one committee that sits in Parliament called the Intelligence and Security Committee, which is allowed to question them about finance and management issues. That's it. So, you know, they have an operation that goes wrong, they engage in criminality, there's nowhere, nobody that can hold them to account. The media won't do it because they're being controlled and spun by the spy agencies. Who is going to do this? And we really do need to think about this because, obviously, we've had the illegal war in Iraq, 
and the illegal war in Afghanistan, predicated on the terrible events of 9-11. And we're probably looking at another war, because we know they want to go into Iran, not just for the oil, but from the very fact that the oil is being traded more increasingly in euros, not dollars, which is another major problem for the American economy. So we have to be very vigilant, I think, because we're seeing under this war on terror a basic wholesale erosion of our freedoms, certainly in the UK, and I would assume pretty much across Europe, especially from that um, awful story, the terrorist story the other day. We have a situation where all our basic rights are being shredded in the name of protecting us against this nebulous Al-Qaeda threat. Of course, we all know Al-Qaeda was sort of funded and trained initially by the CIA and MI6 at least. So what are we looking at in the UK? We have had extraordinary rendition flights, torture flights, stopping off and refueling in our country. We have had the introduction of biometric ID cards imposed on us against everyone's wishes. Uh, they're going to be rolled out next year. We're looking at a whole slew of new counter-terrorism, anti-terrorism laws. Um, even the idea, for example, that in the old days, at the height of the IRA campaign, you could only hold and question without charge a terrorist suspect for seven days. And that has been increased already to 28 days, and the government wants to push it up still further. Now, why? I mean, we're a real threat from the IRA. Al-Qaeda, less so really in the UK. We have other laws as well. There's Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, which means we now cannot protest outside our House of Parliament. You have to get written permission to do that, give them uh, six days' notice. But there are ways around that. We all go and protest on our own now, if that's a possible thing. Um, there are other laws as well that have come into the UK. Something called the Civil Contingency Act, which came into power in uh, 2005, which basically means that any minister can sign a piece of paper, which means that they can enforce a state of emergency in our country. So they can quarantine us in a certain area. They can stop us moving freely around our own country. They can stop us having political meetings. And they can even seize our homes and demolish them for national security reasons, and then not pay a penny compensation to the homeowner. This law just went through. It was whipped through the House of Commons. Nobody questioned it at the time. Nobody questioned it in the media. And it's there now, and we can't do anything about it. But the real, really bad one, that they keep trying to bring in is something called the Legis I can never say this. Legislative and Regulatory Reform Bill. And this has become nicknamed the Abolition of Parliament Bill for obvious reasons, because nobody can ever say it. But uh, they tried to push this law through in January uh, 2006. It was booted out by the House of Lords, which is not usually the sort of bastion of freedom and democracy in our country. But under the terms of this law, we are looking at any government minister again, just by stroke of a pen, can overturn any previous law enacted by our House of Parliament, by our democratic representatives. This shreds 700 years of hard-won democracy in the UK, and they want to try and force it through again. Gordon Brown's Labour government is going to try and reintroduce it to the House of Parliament. There's a big campaign against it, so have a look at it on the internet, the Abolition of Parliament Bill. If this goes through, we will be living in a police state. There is no doubt about it. So this is why we do need to sort of start thinking very deeply about how we can hold the spies to account, what we can do to counter them. Because contrary to the myth, and I hope I've probably you know, showed to a certain extent, they are not um, you know, all competent, all-knowing James Bond figures. Quite often they are quite plodding individuals. And if you rock the boat and you ask questions and think laterally, you are branded a maverick and a subversive. And you know, many of us left for those reasons, should we say. But we need to band together, really. We can't rely on the mainstream media to hold these people to account anymore. Um, we can't rely on the governments to rein them in, because the Labour government seems intent on increasing the resources and the powers and the staffing levels of the spy agencies in the UK. They want to make sure that there is a surveillance society out there. And yes, of course, at the moment, the communities that are being targeted are the Muslim community. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, it was the Irish community. But that obviously isn't going to remain the case. Again, as we heard from that harrowing terrorist story, they are coming for more and more and more of us. And, you know, if you're involved in civil liberties or left-wing politics or hacking community or whatever, we are all going to be increasingly at risk because we will deem, be deemed to be dissidents. So this is a time where we do need to band together. And, you know, what a privilege to be amongst people with such a skills base, such a knowledge base, who can fight back and try and subvert what these people are doing to our countries. 
So please, as I said, um, have a look at some of these issues and do start thinking about them because, as Pastor Niemöller has said, you know, first they came for the communists and I was not a communist, so I did nothing. And then they came for the socialists, so I was not a socialist, trade unionist, not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, I was not a Jew, so I did nothing. And then they came for me. There was no one left to do anything for me. And that's the situation we're sliding into. So please start looking at these issues and start fighting back. We all have to take that stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. I'm really moved. Um, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Next one. Hello. Um. A few weeks ago, I read something about... No, I will start from the beginning. Do you know the RIP Act of, uh, of the UK? It's it RIP. Uh, RIP Act, the Re yes. Regulation yeah, of Investigatory Powers. Is yeah, that right? the Grim okay. Reaper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, two months ago, I read there was a woman that was... Um, uh, she was suggested by the prosecution um, to give out um, personal information from her encrypted hard disk. Mm -hmm. on part two or three of the RIP Act, but this was no official uh, suggestion. So, and she, this woman was an animal activist, mm -hmm. but um, the story just disappeared after it happened. And I would like to know if you know more about this or anybody does. Um, I, don't, I don't remember that particular case, I'm afraid, but um, one trait, one sort of development we're seeing a lot in the UK is that there are various sort of spy type cases hitting the headlines, you know, big terror plot, ricin, shoe bombs on planes, whatever, animal activists as well by the sounds of it. And you get the big screaming headlines, but then they just fade and they're never reported again. You never really see. So exactly. it's almost like the artificial threat is being ramped up yeah. to make us all very afraid and to agree to all these draconian measures. Uh, Repo has actually put in place, um, it replaced an old um, act from the 1980s, the Interception of Communications Act, which governs how and why the spies can intercept our communications. In the old days, all they could do was apply for a warrant from the Home Office, the Home Secretary or the Foreign Office, to intercept your call. And they had to do it, otherwise it was an illegal telephone intercept and they should have been prosecuted. But, you know, they kept getting away with it. There were many, many illegal telephone intercepts that we experienced on the inside. Um, as I mentioned, there was one into the Guardian journalist for a start. Um, in terms of Reaper, that is much more all-embracing. I mean, they can keep our subscriber lists now for months. You know, they don't need a warrant to look at that even. They can go prying very, very easily. I mean, I'm not te technical at all, as some of you will be aware. So I'm not sure exactly how it is done or how we can perhaps counter it, but I'd be willing to hear, I'd be very keen to hear if there are ways around it. So. Any other questions? Yeah, after being on the run, why did you go back to the UK? What is the motivation behind this? Um, as I said, we were sort of on the run and in hiding for a year. Then they failed to extradite him. Then we had two more years in Paris where we did do a lot of campaigning. Um, at that point, David was in France. He couldn't even leave France because if he did, he risked further arrest. Uh, but I used to sort of ping pong backs and forwards between Paris and London, trying to build up media awareness and support. And um, we really felt we'd taken it as far as we could. Also, um, I became very ill that year. I came down with a, well, the worst form of meningitis, which rather puzzled the doctors in France because that form of meningitis didn't exist in Paris at that time. They didn't know where I got it from. So you can make of that what you will. Um, and almost died. And David took the decision then that the strain was just too much and we should go back and face the music. He, as I said, expected to be put on trial rapidly. Um, he was going to fight it by saying that his freedom of expression meant that you know, he could disclose criminality on the part of the spies. But um, unfortunately, they sort of stitched him up through this whole process of pre-trial hearings, and he ended up being convicted, which is a real shame, because in terms of precedent for other whistleblowers, we're now seeing a whole slew of intelligence whistleblowers being prosecuted in the same way. So 
But yeah, we went back, one, because we'd taken it as far as we could, I think, from abroad. Two, I think you realize that you can't spend your entire life in exile. Um, it does get to you mentally, being trapped in one country. And uh, three, he wanted to make a strong political statement, you know. Good morning, and uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you. What is the mindset of the management of these security services? When I um, hear the mindset of our community, mm -hmm. it is um, we look into the future and we say, I don't want my children to live in a world like that. Mm. But why does the management of the security services um, head us for a police state, and do they see, think this is a des desirable thing? Yeah, <laughs> basically. I think, um, I mean, any journalist knows everyone, think, everyone always thinks they personally are good people. I'm sure they think they are genuinely doing something to protect the country. But the problem is um, MI5 and MI6 operate in a uniquely secret environment, even compared to other spy agencies, because there is no accountability. They have the protection of the Official Secrets Act. Um, so you end up with a sort of self-perpetuating oligarchy where the people who question are told not to rock the boats. So they either learn to shut up and put up. Um, and then they will progress up the management chain, or they leave. So you end up with usually the dullards who can't find other jobs progressing slowly up the chain and becoming the head or whatever, or senior management. And as I said, it's sort of self-perpetuating because they, they verify each other. They don't learn from their mistakes. They will bury their mistakes. They will lie to government ministers about their mistakes. So there's no constructive criticism either. They can get away with it. So I think it's, it's those two things um, really lead to that mindset. It's interesting as well, because when you go into that job, you do really feel that you can do something good, you know, to help protect your country and you know, save people's lives. So to go from that sort of idealism to this sort of fossilized, power-crazed uh, position is quite, an, a, quite a journey, I think. I mean, one of the things that um, really hit me, I think, last year when I heard about it, was the idea that intelligence officers from six and five are involved in the extraordinary rendition program and the interrogation of suspects at these secret prisons. Not necessarily doing the torture, but present during the interrogations and feeding back questions to the people being tortured. And I suppose they're people who are my generation. I mean, if I'd stayed, I'd now be sort of middle, senior, junior senior management or whatever. And they'd be the people doing this. And they might be people who are my friends that I went out drinking with or, you know, had around for dinner. So how do they go from those people to people who can collude in torture? I don't know. But I really, I, yeah, I think they probably think they're doing it for the, for the good of society, you know. It's almost a nanny-ish sort of mindset. We'll, we'll protect you. You don't need to worry about it. Give us more power. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, you've had one. Anyone else? <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that experience with us. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, listening to what happened to you, it doesn't seem to be quite a success story, in, in, in my opinion. Having revisited and experienced what you did, what would you do differently if you had to go through that same experience again, number one? Uh. Number two, um, what is the learning experience that the Secret Services actually had? Uh, did you discover any, uh, anything in uh, revisiting what happened to you? Do you think if all that happened again, would it happen differently or would it be just the same all over again? <laughs> I think, well, to answer the second one first, um, I think it will happen all over again. There will inevitably be another whistleblower at some point, um, soon probably. There seems to be about one a decade. The services don't learn from their mistakes. They will mythologize the whistleblower within the service, um, demonize them, turn them into you know, someone who had personal problems or a grudge or was unstable or whatever. They won't actually address what the critique of the message is. They will shoot the messenger. Um, so I think it's inevitable that that will happen again, happen again. In terms of how we would have done things differently, yes, definitely, there are things we would have done differently. Uh, one would have been not to trust bloody journalists, <laughs> on the whole. <laughs> they just um, asset strip you of information. <laughs> there are some good journalists. I mean, I, you know, I can think of three in the UK that have integrity, but... <laughs> Uh, but also, of course, this was in 97, and um, we should have used the internet a lot more, and we should have just put all the information out there, and then they could have done their worst. But, you know, it would have been 
had much more impact, and I think we should have done that. Unfortunately, we were pretty Luddite, well, I still am, technologically,、um, because MI5 is appalling with its IT as well.、Um, when we first joined in 93,、uh, sorry, 91,、um, nobody had computers to work on. Everyone had to handwrite everything and get a secretary to type it up. And even in 93, they were still using. Um, a database for the IRA terrorists called Durbar, that was its code name. And this was a sort of 1970s beige sort of computer,、uh, all in one with the sort of terminal and keyboard. That was in 1993. That was their, their shit hot IT at the time. They then spent about 10 years trying to develop a, their own in house system, which they code named Grant, which just couldn't, they couldn't get it to work. So in desperation, they bought Microsoft off the shelf. <laughs> I know. So, the whole of their IT、um, is run on Microsoft 95, as、uh, codename <laughs> code Corona. So, you really couldn't make it up. So, for that reason, neither of us was particularly internet savvy at that point.、Um, but yes,、uh, Dave got up to speed very quickly and started building his own website, which、um, strangely was hacked just before it went live as well. It was around the time when he was arrested in 98. He'd、uh, got the domain name. And was just waiting for the password to come through, and then he got nabbed on the streets of Paris. And、um, it turned out, when we questioned this, that the password had been intercepted from the、uh, internet service provider en route to Dave. Now, I don't know that, how technically feasible that is, but anyway, someone had picked up the password, gone into the site, and sort of written all sorts of rude things about him on the front page, which again struck me as slightly odd because people don't usually do that to anti, anti establishment websites.、Um, when we took it up with the Californian ISP, They said、um, they thought it was a professional job, that the password had been seized and、um, that the thing had been hacked. It was also interesting, as well, just one a little coda to that, is that、um, the government, who take, the UK government, had taken out this injunction against Shaler. And they said to the Californian internet service provider, You are aware that we have an injunction against this man, you can't host his site. The Californian、um, company just turned around and said, Piss off, what about 1776? Anyway,、um, yes,、yeah, so that would have been the one big thing we would have done differently is use of the, the internet. Just put all the information out there and they could have done their worst. It would have been there, would have you know, hit the headlines. Hopefully, there would have been an inquiry into the crimes of the spies.、Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, one more question, perhaps. It's now half、yes. past. I don't want to. Over here. Hello? I've got, I've、oh, got、right. it.、Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I,、uh, I'm part of those、uh, campaigns like the Abolition of Parliament Act and have been following these for a while.、Uh, but、uh, I want to ask you、uh, more about the journalists because I'm always baffled at how easy they seem to be to be manipulated when you think of them that they're、uh, professionals. They ought to have seen all this before and they ought to have some kind of embarrassment, not so much integrity, but just embarrassment at being played for the fool year、mm. after year. Is, have you got any comments as to why they, why they do this? Why they allow themselves to, to, to be manipulated? And do they enjoy being manipulated in this way? <laughs> Thank you. I think some do, yeah. No, there's a couple of basic reasons, I think. One is、uh, obviously most journalists go into journalism because they want to be the new Woodward and Bernstein. You know, they want to do their bit,、um, but quickly realize they're up against editors who, and even the proprietors of newspapers with a line to push. So they've got to churn out the copy and get their name in print and all that sort of thing. And if you're, if you're reporting on things like intelligence or defence or home affairs or even politics, you are given briefings. Now, if you don't print those briefings or if you question those briefings, then、um, you're not given future ones. So you don't get the information to do your job. And the, apparently, because I'm also a slight journalist myself on the side sometimes and a member of the union, they've been doing some、um, calculations on this. Apparently, journalists now have to produce four times as much copy in half the time as they did 20 years ago. So they're just constantly on this treadmill. It's also very seductive. If you're a journalist and you're invited into the charmed secret circle, then it's very sexy and it can give you status amongst your peers. There was an article by a chap called David Rose, quite a well respected journalist. Um, recently, in、uh, the New Statesman in the UK, and he said that he had been approached by MI6 about a decade ago and was drip fed stories. And it got to a point where he was compromised by that as a journalist, but if he stopped, it would cause him problems. He wouldn't get the copy, he'd lose his job, and of course, they got to pay the rent and all that sort of thing. So I think it's a sort of a carrot and stick situation. One, you've got to do what they tell you, otherwise, you can't do your job. But two, you're flattered as well that you are inducted into the charm circle. 
There are, as I said, there are some journalists who will take the risk and stick their neck out, and I really salute them. But on the whole, I don't know, <laughs> a shower. <laughs> anyway, I think we're probably out of time, but um, thank you very much all for coming, and um, I've really enjoyed being here, so thank you. Thank you.